Our next witness is John Lott. Mr. Lott is the president of a newly formed organization, the Crime Prevention Research Center. He previously served in research or a teaching position at the University of Chicago and Yale, among other schools. He was the chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission from 1988 to 1990. He's currently a weekly columnist and contributor for foxnews.com. He received his Ph.D. in economics from UCLA. Mr. Lott, please proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Durbin and uh, Ranking Member Cruz and other distinguished members. Stand your ground laws help people. Oh, I apologize. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, stand your ground laws will help people be able to defend themselves. It's the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, primarily poor blacks, who benefit the most from having the option to be able to protect themselves. What's been lost in part of this discussion so far is the reason why states have adopted these laws. Requiring people to retreat as far as possible creates confusion, creates doubt, and can make it more difficult for people to be able to go and defend themselves. In Florida, blacks made of about 16% of the population, but they account for 31% of the state's defendants invoking stand your ground laws. Black defendants who invoke the statute justify their actions, to justify their actions are actually acquitted almost eight percentage points more often than whites. The Tampa Bay Tribune has put together very detailed data on stand your ground cases. Up through July 24th of this year, uh, from two th beginning of 2006, the newspaper had collected 112 cases. The p information that they had that often constitutes their shocking finding is that 72% of those <coughs> who, were ki who killed a black person faced no penalty, compared to 59% of those who killed a white person. 80% of those who killed Hispanics were also not convicted. What one needs to remember, however, in this, is that the vast majority of these crimes are within race. So for example, 90% of blacks who were killed in Stand Your Ground cases uh, invoked, who invoked Stand Your Ground uh, were killed by other blacks. In the case of whites, it was 85%. In the case of Hispanics, it was 100%. The basic point is, is that if you're going to concentrate on the fact that relatively few people who kill blacks are going to be convicted using stand your ground defenses, you have to realize that almost all those people who aren't being convicted are blacks. 69% of blacks who raised the stand your ground defense were not convicted. That compares to a little bit less than 62% for whites. 80% of Hispanics who raise the stand your ground uh, defense are not convicted. If blacks are supposedly being discriminated against because their killers so often are not facing any penalty, wouldn't it also follow that blacks are being discriminated in favor of when blacks who claim self-defense under the stand your ground law are convicted at much lower rates than other racial groups? The problem also is not all these cases are the same. Uh, blacks are killed uh, in confrontations where were 13 percentage points more likely to be armed than whites. By a 43 to 16 percent margin, blacks uh, killed, again by killed by other blacks, were also more often in the process of committing another crime. They also were involved in cases where it's much more likely to have a witness present. If you go and run regressions where you try to account for all the factors that are brought up in the Tampa Bay Tribune data set, what you find is that white defendants are more likely to be convicted by black defendants, and people invoking stand your ground laws who kill blacks were also more likely to be convicted than those who killed whites. What you find when you look at it, and fortunately this is the case, uh, the people who initiated the confrontation uh, were more likely to be convicted. And when there were eyewitnesses, uh, they were less likely to be convicted. Armed uh, individuals, and when more than one person was killed, also were much more likely to result in convictions. The Urban Institute report uh, that was brought up earlier, uh, I think actually shows the opposite of what uh, has been quoted here. Um, one of the important things just to mention, John Roman, who wrote this, noted, stand your ground laws appears to exacerbate, well, he ex he said they appear to exacerbate racial differences, but he acknowledges his data lacks details available in the Tampa Day, Bay Tribune data. Quote, the data here cannot completely address this problem because the setting of the incident cannot be observed. And if you go through his paper, what you find he has no data 
uh, no information on whether an eyewitness saw the confrontation, no evidence, on, no data on whether there was a physical evidence. He has no uh, evidence on a whole range of things in order to try to factor those into account. The big thing, if you look at his study, the central finding is to look at table three. And what you find is that when blacks are under stand your ground laws, their situation in terms of conviction rates actually fall. If you look at the, the Texas A&M study that was mentioned, they do not account for any other gun control laws. If you're going to look at stand your ground laws, whether you have right to carry, the number of people who have permits is going to be important. And when you account for those things, their results disappear. If you're talking about castle doctrines, whether people are able to get quick access to guns is going to be important. And again, nothing about gun lock or safe storage laws are accounted for in those studies. And when you do that, their results also disappear. Thank you, Mr. Lund.